I'm Tim Garland. You're listening to the Trail Connection Podcast. Everybody, welcome back to the Trail Connection podcast. This week, I've got a friend, uh, Kurt Walker, joining me today, and haven't seen him in a while. He's been uh, up in Tennessee for a couple of years, yeah. so I want to welcome you back to Florida and welcome to the show. Thanks. Good to be here. So, uh, why don't you introduce yourself for a minute and tell everybody who you are, where you're from, what you do, all that kind of stuff. Uh, well, I'm from all over the place. Uh, I used to live here uh, in the Tampa area. And my family and I moved to Nashville, I guess, about seven years ago for some work opportunities. Um, I work in software development, uh, mostly web programming, but I do some so a little bit of app development, too. And um, we lived up there for about seven years and recently uh, decided, you know, we, we missed the heat and the hurricanes. And <laughs> mostly the friends and family here is what pulled us yeah. back. Yeah. Well, you came at the right time. We got two hurricanes two coming at the same time. Yeah, going to collide in the middle, I guess. Yeah. And it's been raining like every day for the yeah, last 90 days. Yeah. So um, conveniently, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about rain, some shelter options, uh, fire starters, all that, all that kind of stuff. And so um, I wanted to bring you on because I, I hear you're a pretty experienced guy. Um, it's funny, when I first started going on the uh, Appalachian Trail a couple years ago, I took John Krim with me, mm-hmm. and on the way up there, he was telling me about a trip that you and him and Kevin took, how, like, you had your ultralight gear, and they were all, like, <laughs> way packed down and yeah. dying. <laughs> and so, uh, you kind of stuck out in my mind at that point as somebody I wanted to bring on the show at some point. So, okay. Um, so, how long have you been hiking? Ah, man, I've been hiking since I was a kid, and... Um, my parents say that I didn't enjoy it as a kid, you know. I mean, when I say kid, I think probably uh, seven or eight years old. You know, we would go to the, the Smokies. Mm-hmm. Um, I lived in northern Georgia for a while and also Alabama. And um, the Smokies were kind of like the closest spot where you could go and get some serious mountain hikes if you wanted to. But there was also kid-friendly stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I guess I started when I was a kid. I don't think I really started to appreciate it until I was a teenager, though. Um, you know, late high school, early college, a couple of things in particular kind of drew me out to want to do it for myself. And um, one of them was I was starting to get into photography and I wanted to take pictures like I saw in Backpacker Magazine, yeah. and Outdoor Photographer, and, yeah. you know, all those guys with the cover shots and just these amazing pictures inside were were taking their pictures in national parks they were taking Mm -hmm. them in places that you can't drive to right yeah and and so that's one of the things that that made me want to pack up a backpack and go out there on my own and try to you know take a picture that i would be really proud of Mm -hmm. Um, but i also met some friends in college who were just getting into it and uh, i went to college here in florida but also in virginia for a while and i lived literally at the foot of the Appalachians. I mean, you could be at a trailhead. You could be at an Appalachian Trail crossing from my house in about 30 minutes drive. Oh, wow. And so um, the college I was going to, you know, I met some guys and, you know, they were wanting to get into it. And so um, we started out just doing overnighters mm-hmm. um, at some of the peaks yeah. over the Roanoke Valley in Virginia. And from there, you know, the the passion kind of grew, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard not to get addicted to. Yeah, it's really hard. Whenever you get a couple good hikes in or get a couple good views from some vistas, yeah, it's hard to not want to do that again. Yeah. No, that's cool. Um, you mentioned photography. That's uh, that's kind of something that 
it wasn't necessarily a draw for me to get into hiking per se. Like I, I grew up, you know, when we take vacations in North Carolina, Tennessee, we do some like little short hikes, you know, up to some different peaks or things like that, or just loop trails. Yeah. So I always loved it. I just love being in the mountains period. Um, but when I first started kind of getting into the backpacking type stuff, it actually started with uh, kayaking. And then I was like, I want to do some like minimalist camping that I can pack my kayak up. And it just kind of like led me to backpacking gear. And I was like, hmm, that'd be cool. And then yeah. I was like, Appalachian Trail, that'd be awesome. Uh-huh. And so I planned my first section hike and then took John with me on that. And uh, How yeah. far was that? We started at the fontana dam uh-huh. and we worked south to the noc so it was a little over 30 miles like 30, yeah 34 miles something like i know that. that exact spot so the 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 fontana dam um is where i ended my first section hike we started at the um the i-40 crossing mm-hmm. that's like at the other end of the smokies yeah um and we came out at the dam and then one of my friends who's you know pretty hardcore guy his name's josh um decided he was gonna keep going and he ended up doing the noc section okay um, he's, he's one of those people that's kind of, I've learned a lot from him. You know, if Josh is listening, you know, he, he's definitely, uh, motivated me to kind yeah. of try some new things. Yeah. Um, he's one of those guys that's going to cover some ground. So if you backpack with him, you got to be ready for 15 to 20 mile days, which yeah. to me is a good hike, you know, oh, yeah. for some people that's kind of a normal, hike, yeah. but for me, that's kind of a, yeah, that's a haul. You know? Yeah. For, well, for me. First time hiker, well, first time backpacker, and first time on the the Appalachian Trail with John, like, we totally messed up our plan, because I was thinking, like, yeah, 10 miles a day is good, but 10 turned into, like, 14 on day (laughs) one, because the mileage was off, and so, like, you know, we did that, and we were dead, like, the next few days, and it was, like, between 8 and 10 is what we planned, but we always did between, like, 12 and 14, Mm -hmm. and that's just a lot whenever you're out of shape and doing it for the first time and overpacked because like mm-hmm. um, you know rookie over way 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 overpacked and so just a lot of extra weight and stuff even though it like killed my body i loved it i wanted to go i couldn't yep. wait to go back and john said the same thing i mean it took us like three days to recover from the soreness but like as soon as we got our legs back we're like man, can't, can't wait to go back yeah but uh get, going back to the photography thing you know, I've been I've been trying to grow the podcast and, and grow the social media account through Instagram. So photography has kind of became more of an importance to me just from a standpoint of like documenting the places that I've been, but also sharing that to like draw people into wanting to explore, mm-hmm. especially since I'm kind of a newer hiker. I'm kind of gained towards that audience that I want to try to intrigue and, and inspire people to be like, oh, that's a really cool spot. That's not that hard of a trail. I want to go see it. Yeah. So. That's definitely become a little bit more of a passion here recently, and most of it's shot on iPhone or you know GoPros. Yeah, like that. it's amazing the quality of images that people can capture now with phones. I mean, when I first started trying to take pictures um, outdoors, it was still in the film days. Mm-hmm. It was thirty-five millimeter film, oh, wow. and um, you know, there's there's just a whole lot writing on the settings. You know, when you only have twenty-four or thirty-six frames, then you got to pay to have them develop. Yeah. But I mean, I I feel like I learned where the places were in America that are really worth hiking Mm -hmm. through photography magazines. Because I I saw pictures that just, I went, where is that? I have to know where that place is. And, oh, this is Acadia National Park or something. And, and, you know, I I feel like that's where um, my bucket list started to form was just looking at outdoor photography. Well, that's that's me too. I mean, there's a ton of Instagram accounts I follow that are a lot of them are over in the Northwest area, like in in Washington State, Oregon, North California. And just there's some amazing spots there that like, it just is breathtaking. You can't believe that's America. Yeah, like, so and there's parts of the country that I've never been to up in that area. So it really intrigued me and inspired me to like, I need to get my my feet wet on the AT and like on this East Coast. And then I want to head out there and do some real big peaks yeah. and stuff like that. So, but that that's cool. Um, so, what are some of the what are some of the bigger like well known trails that you've done? Well, um, yeah, like I said, I I think my first backpacking trip was on, was on the AT. Um, my first one ever really was when I was in the Boy Scouts, and uh, not a real positive experience because the backpack that I had I borrowed and I made all the same went way too heavy Mm -hmm. kind of mistakes but I was using really old gear um really heavy sleeping bag that was way too big for me 
uh, a, an external frame pack, which is fine, but the one that I borrowed, neither myself or the person that lent it to me realized the, the waist strap was missing. <laughs> oh, wow. And so I was miserable. I mean, all of my fellow scouts were way ahead of me, and I didn't even know what the problem was. I just thought I'm weak and I'm slow and I'm, yeah. I'm not good at this. And then one of my scout masters saw what was happening, and we basically MacGyvered a, a waist belt right there on the trail. And just as soon as I stood up, it completely changed oh, my yeah. outlook on the whole experience. Oh, yeah. right? Um, but I, I wish I could remember to this day where that was, but I don't. I don't remember um, which part of the AT it was. But uh, my first, you know, backpacking trip that I planned myself was to Dragon's Tooth, which is uh, in Roanoke, Virginia. Yeah. Um, not a not a long hike at all. It's it's probably less than three miles from the parking lot up the AT to the peak, and then from that same parking lot, if you go in the opposite direction. Um, you can get to McAfee's Knob, which is kind of an iconic uh, overlook. But, you know, the first time I hiked it was probably 2002. Mm-hmm. And you really nobody... It's it's interesting. I think that there's been kind of a, a revival of some kind because, you know, backpacking is is kind of a mainstream, popular, hip thing to do, more way more so than it was when I got started. Mm-hmm. And so we would go up to McAfee's, me and my friends, we'd be the only ones up there. Right. And it was just kind of this special feeling the next morning to come down. And everywhere I went that day, I would think, you know, I slept on top of that mountain right over there, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and nobody else was up there. And we were as self-sufficient as we really felt like we could be. Uh, But nowadays, when you go up there, obviously, it's a little more, you know, crowded. But yeah, but yeah, those are kind of the first two um, places, the first two trails. After that, um, you know, when my wife and I met, uh, she had a lot of cool stories, um, from her time in the park service. So she worked internships in California and she had hiked, uh, Kings Canyon and Yosemite mm-hmm. places I hadn't been yet. You know, yeah. at that point I had only been as far West as, um, Colorado. Yeah. So she and I kind of fed off of each other's passion for it. We ended up, uh, traveling out to California and we backpacked in the Sequoias. Um, we went to... Uh, let's see. We went to Can- um, yeah, we went to Canada uh, for about a two week long trip with some other friends, and we went up to Banff National Park. We right. got to see that's the- on my top bucket list, man. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, the Canadian Rockies are just on a completely different scale. I mean, there were places where it was a three hundred and sixty degree view, and you couldn't see any landscape that looked familiar. It was just all jagged, yeah, you know. Rockies, yeah, and it was it was really cool. We also went to uh, Utah, and we we backpacked with my brother, um, Canyonlands and Arches, mm-hmm. and that's a totally different landscape. Yeah, um, feel like you're on another planet oh, for sure. almost. To your point, you know, it's amazing that America has so many different climates and landscapes yeah. and and biospheres and everything. Um, those are just a few that come to mind. And then the, I guess the biggest trip I did was just a few years ago um, when we hiked the section over the the Smokies. We were southbound from mm-hmm. I forty down to Fontana Dam. Yeah, yeah, that southbound hike uh, for us when we when we were going from the dam down to NOC. Both of us were saying because the whole third day was like just straight. Yeah, downhill. that descent to the dam is crazy. Yeah, and so like we were just, when we got down to the to the NOC, we were having lunch there on the river and. We we're just like, dude, I would hate to be going northbound right now. Like, <laughs> yeah. we thought it was bad our first day. Like, how would you like to start that section and like then you know continue yeah. on through? So, I, I mean, I think it was overall a good experience to start it that way. Um, it's kind of a odd odd place to just pick a section of the trail and mm-hmm. start. But uh, you know, my roots growing up, I, I loved the Carolinas. Always vacationed up there. So like when I was planning my trip. I knew I wanted to hike those mountains because I was familiar with them. And so, um, I mean, the last section that I did uh, last year, I went back in the fall, and we started at the Amalcoa State Falls or, or Falls State Park, and we went up the approach trail, yeah. and then we went up Springer, and then we went like, uh, I think we pulled off at Cooper Gap, which is like 15 miles or 16 miles in. Mm-hmm. But overall, it was, it was about 30 miles again that we did, um, three-day trip, so... It, that was that was a good section. I can't wait to get back on and then pick back up. Yeah, and I, I'm probably gonna continue like Cooper and work my way up. Okay. Just keep going, and then once I get to the NOC and Fontana section, I'll just skip over that and go through. Yeah, um, but I do. I've got a I've got a scheduled show um, in in this season that I'm wanting to do talking about the the shelters. Um, 
and I know in Smoky Mountain National Park, you can only do the shelters. And so yeah. I want to go do that and then have somebody on to talk about that. So that'll be a cool show. Um, yeah, I think I've stayed in maybe, I don't know, maybe half of the shelters that go through the Smokies. Because when we made our itinerary, um, we wanted to cover, you know, longer distances. And we would, maybe a third of the shelters is a more, more fair estimate. So we would, you know, we would like stop at a shelter the first night hike all day the next day, probably skip two or three of them and then stay at the next one. Yeah. They all kind of follow the same formula. Um, some are in better shape than others. You know, yeah. I found that for the most part, people uh, honored the regulations, you know, that you needed a permit and you're not supposed to just tent camp around them. We had a couple of them that I don't know what happened, but they were way over capacity. Yeah. And so at that point you have to do something. You yeah. Know? But we were in the, we were in the shelter beds um, every night of that trip. I got you. That's, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know how I feel about it yet. I don't like the idea of it because right. I kind of like being on my own, but right. I think that the, you know, I'll probably get into it in that episode, but just like the camaraderie, like meeting people, that's mm-hmm. kind of where you do it is in yep. the shelter. So, so let's talk about, uh, rain. So, um, all of my experience so far with rain has been terrible as far as like um, with the setups. Yeah. And so, um, I don't know how much experience you have with like, you know, getting, getting set up with a good shelter or, you know, what, what, whenever you're, you're not staying in a shelter, are you tent camping or hammock camping? Tent camping. I've, I've wanted to try hammock camping, but I haven't done it yet. Okay. Yeah. So my, I started out hammock camping okay. and I've kind of like maneuvered towards tent now, but like, I kind of go back and forth. I, I love hammock camping cause it's just really versatile mm-hmm. and I sleep really well in mine, but, um, I was just curious because the first time that it really, it, rain really affected us was that first trip on the AT. Me and John got like hurricane force winds on through one of the, it was pretty bad. And both of us had hammocks. So we were just getting like whipped around all night. <laughs> but I like totally botched the, the, uh, the tarp tie down mm-hmm. uh, on my, uh, on my hammock. And so like the whole bottom was just getting pelted gotcha. and like, obviously Water's going to travel and wick through. Yeah. So, like, I woke up soaking wet. Oh, man. And then had to carry that. Yeah, that sounds so, awful. <laughs> yeah. And then the other experience with rain was with a tent. And kind of similar situation. We didn't really have it on the radar. I mean, we were aware that it was in the area, but it wasn't, like, forecasted for us to get any. Yeah. And both of us woke up in the middle of the night to just a torrential downpour. And uh, Brad's tent got full of water. Mine kind of got blown in some, but I woke up wet again. So... Not good experiences. So, what do you, do you have any tips or any uh, suggestions on how to Man, I, combat that? I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what the standard procedure is with hammocks because I've never done it. I've I've seen a hammock set up one time. We were uh, we were just car camping, um, big group of people, and somebody that came brought their hammock set up and kind of demonstrated how she put it up. And I was really fascinated by it because it, it looks like a super lightweight option. Oh, yeah. Um, and especially if you're just planning to, you know, sleep solo. Mm-hmm. Um, she had, you know, probably a similar setup, you know, just a like a zip cord with, you know, the tarp kind of tinted over it. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always tent camped unless, you know, I'm in that situation in the Smokies where they require you to stay in the shelter. And... Um, I've always just gone with the rain fly that comes with the tent. Mm -hmm. The tents I've bought have been, you know, pretty reliable. My my first one uh, that my wife and I shared was a North Face. It Mm -hmm. was just a two-person North Face and um, came with a rain fly, had a vestibule. We used that for six days when we were in Canada, and um, we were so lucky that trip. I mean, you would think if you're out for six days, surely you'll get rained on at least one day. It wasn't until the very last day we had already you know, broken camp for the last time. We had maybe eight or nine miles between us and the car. And that's when it, it rained mm-hmm. on us. And when we got back to the car, we were headed to the showers at that point. So we didn't care. Yeah. Um, but we did get rained on uh, when we hiked in the in the uh, Smokies. And um, we, we actually didn't have a tent with us. We were in the shelters. Mm-hmm. So in that case, we were just sort of cobbling together um, makeshift you know, materials, makeshift little patches to like keep stuff from dripping on us because those shelters aren't perfect, you know, by any means. Um, I've been just extraordinarily lucky with rain, I think. I've been snowed on. No, I've been, I've been seriously snowed on uh, 
with my friend Chuck, um, and it wasn't my tent in that case either. He had a Black Diamond Mega Mid, I believe was the name of the tent. I'm not even sure if they still make it. But what you do is you... That's you, the same headlight company, right? Or is yes, it different? yes okay. same company. Um, it's an octagon shape, like this table, and you just stake it really tight, and you put one trekking pole up in the middle, yep. kind of like a teepee. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's supposed to be really strong in the wind. Um, don't ask me why, because with one pole, I don't know. But it did. I mean, we were up there in the middle of a snowstorm, and I mean, we were both laying in the tent with our headlamps just watching that thing go nuts. Yeah. When we woke up, you know, we had an inch of snow wow. all around it. We were busting the snow off, and it, it held on just fine with the with the rain fly. Mm-hmm. Um, and the sequoias, we got rain or uh, snowed on even more than that in the same two-person tent that we took into Canada. That was actually kind of the... <laughs> It was like the practice run for some new gear. I got you. Uh, we went to Bakersfield, California, picked up our friend Marty, and then uh, we did an overnighter in the Sequoias, and then we went to the Rockies. And in the Sequoias, uh, I mean, there was so much snow on the tent. I remember Jen kind of had like the ceiling sort of wrapping her kind of like a burrito, oh, wow. and she had to like push it off in the morning. And I tell you what, I mean, it's it's just one layer of fabric, but the rain flies, if it says waterproof, you know, you can yeah. trust it for the most part. Yeah. So the tent I just bought, the first one I had was a um, mountain engineering. Um, I'm trying to remember what, what the name of it. It's just a single, like, one-man tent, little pop-up. And I love it. It's really good. It's really lightweight. Um, but I ended up upgrading. My wife and I did one trip together, and uh, it was just way too cramped. I thought, you know, we're married, we'll cuddle, you know, right. no big deal. But, yeah. no, you need, you need, <laughs> you need a space. little space. So. Yeah. I ended up, uh, I just recently bought um, the Climate uh, Maxfield okay. two-person, and um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do an a unboxing video here this week and, and kind of give it a little review, but so far, I mean, I set it up in the house in the living room, and it, it pops up really nice, and I think it'll be it'll be good, um, but it's got a good rain fly that comes with it and footprint, you know, you lay down underneath yeah. it and everything, but... Um, yeah, I think the problem with me with the, with the hammock the first time was I, I didn't... I've kind of decided that I just don't pull it taut enough. And so, like, it's got some sag to it. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing was I set the um, the apex of the, the rain fly just too high. So, like, it was hanging below, and it was real strong wind. Yeah. So it was just kind of hitting underneath. And then my knot tying skills weren't the greatest up there. So, like, you know, one of the corners kind of came loose. Yeah. And it was just – it just wasn't tight. So mm-hmm. it was whipping quite a bit. And then with the – with the tent situation, that that mountain engineering tent's got a really good like teardrop shape rain fly to where it kind of wraps around the back and pulls to a point so you can put some gear outside of the tent. And I just had one side of that like kicked open to get some airflow yeah. in there because we weren't expecting the rain. But I mean, I, I so far I I've had some unpleasant experiences but for the most part it's been manageable where you can hang up the stuff. So it's kind of a good segue. And then the next question I had was like. Do you have any tips or have you had any experience with getting, like, gear soaking wet? And, like, how do you go about keeping important stuff dry and and all that? Yeah, just keeping stuff dry. I mean, there's some pretty cost-effective solutions out there. You can also spend as much as you want on dry bags. Mm -hmm. And I I did that at one point. Um, The dry bags are really, really effective. Uh, I, I backpacked one time with... Um, probably some of the nicest camera gear I've ever taken on the trail. And I had all of that wrapped in some some dry bags. But, you know, the dry bags add their own amount of weight, right? Yeah. Um, well, which ones do you use or which ones have you used? They were made by OR, um, I think was the name of the company. And, I mean, they've long since uh, worn out. And I kind of switched to... You know, things like freezer bags, Mm -hmm. um, stuff that if it gets torn up while we're out there, I can just toss it and not worry about it. Um, As far as like while you're out there, um, you know, I I learned most of it from watching other people in the Smokies and in the Rockies. You've got to you've really got to worry about um, bears and keeping your you know, your food safe. Yeah. And so in the, in the Rockies, they had these really elaborate, um, food hanging rigs where you could just walk up and pull on a steel cable. There's a pulley 50 Mm -hmm. feet up or something, and then you can hang your stuff. But even then, um, if once it's hung in the air, you know, what do you do if it rains? 
And uh, I would just take a trash bag and cut as small of a hole as I could in the top, you know, put that over the pack. And then with one carabiner, you know, poke that through the top of the hole. There's also that hole, though, what that water can get in. I saw a friend of mine um, had taken like a milk crate and he had cut sort of a little miniature umbrella shape out of it and made a tiny hole in the middle of that. And so that slid over the line mm-hmm. and kind of like yeah. routed water over the hole that you make in the... I gotcha. And, you know, his stuff was bone dry. Mm-hmm. Mine, you know, there was a little wet spot on the top of my pack, but the clothes inside were dry. You yeah. know, the food was dry. Just simple stuff like that um, has worked pretty well for me, I think. Yeah. So I, I, I did a show early in the season where... Um, Joseph Maydell and I went kayaking, and we talked about dry bags mm-hmm. and, and things like that. And at that point, I had had like a, uh, I, th- I don't, it's, I don't think it's Cedar Summit. It was a, it's a different kind of off-brand one, but it was a really thick like, oh, it was the Ozark Trail. It was one from Walmart. It was mm-hmm. like super, super thick like plasticky canvas type material and really hard to manipulate, but it was like pretty secure. Like nothing yeah. got dry. I mean, nothing got wet in there. But um, since then, I've come across uh, Osprey makes really good dry bags, and okay. they're pretty affordable. I mean, they're a little they're pricey for it's the kind where you you kind of roll it up and then clip it. Yeah, yeah. But they like they weigh nothing. I mean, it's hmm. it's as far as weight goes, and they have a little capacity to give some. Okay. Um, the trip that me and Brad took on the AT, I took all the podcast gear because we were planning on recording up there, and I had one of those bags with my recorder and a mic and yeah. all that kind of stuff packed in it totally dry the whole time but it's um they're you know they can get a little pricey if you're buying a bunch of them but for me like i don't think i would pack anything that is not in a dry bag that i wanted to keep semi dry like I, i talked about on on the review of that trip like my back was sweating like crazy and eating into my pack. (laughs) So like my sleeping bag was wet. Yeah. It comes from both directions. Yeah. So, um, you know, I had, I had a buddy of mine write in after that episode and talk about, uh, some of the backpacks that are kind of the canvas material that it's almost the whole pack is a dry Mm -hmm. bag. Haven't tried any of those yet, but I really like, I like the Osprey bags because they're almost like a stuff sack and a dry bag in one. And so, um, I'm going to buy a bigger one to like put my sleeping bag in and then I'll try to upgrade yeah. a little bit here and there to put other gear in. But, you know, for the most part, um, <laughs> what I've talked about before is like the issue of, okay, you get, you have your dry bags, but then your stuff that you are wearing or whatever gets wet. Then, How do you dry it out? Yeah. Then yeah. it just becomes like a, a soil sack. Like you, know, you keep it in there. <laughs> yeah. It's just going to get mildewy, you know, yeah. like the longer you hike. So we tried to do clotheslines and stuff like that, mm-hmm. but you know, depending on the climate and the altitude and all that, like if the air is moist, so it's not yeah, dry. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, we had that problem the whole time we were in the Smokies. We were really hiking. The joke was like we're we're hiking a section of the Appalachian Creek, you know, because yeah. it was just flowing water down the trail in mm-hmm. in a lot of places. It rained. I mean, like at least three days out of six. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I I learned a few tricks, I guess, on that on that trip about how to dry stuff because my feet got wet on day two and they stayed wet, but they stayed damp, you Mm -hmm. know, for like three or four days. Um, and something that my friend Josh kind of urged me to do before we started that trip was bring a pair of what he calls camp shoes. Mm -hmm. And that was something I'd never really thought of before. And I didn't have any quote unquote camp shoes. He had a nice pair of, uh, they just look like tennis shoes, but they're extremely light. They're extremely breathable. They dry out in a matter of hours if they get completely soaked. Yeah. So I just thought, well, I'm going to grab, you know, my flip-flops, tie them to the outside of the pack. Yeah, I've got I've got a pair of uh, Merrill shoes that are like trail runners that uh, are super lightweight that um, they, they dry out. They're kind of wicking. They dry out pretty quickly, and I've, I've been able to use those. I didn't. I didn't use those on that last trip. Um, I took them with me, but it was I left them in the truck. It was kind of like the game time decision. You yeah. know? We got there, decided I didn't want the extra stuff. I had the podcast gear. I had my camera, like my digital camera, and just extra stuff that I didn't need. So I was like, I'll leave the shoes. But then I ended up walking around barefoot on rocks, and like that wasn't that wasn't cool. So, um, but I ended up using uh, my A-frame uh, Rainfly for my hammock. I took with me as kind of an extra rain fly for the, the tents. The first night I didn't set that up, but the second night I did kind of as a, a 
a frame over a clothesline and try to get my yeah. clothes hung up in there, but it just didn't it didn't work. But it was we could not for the life of us get a, a fire started at all the whole time we were there, which is a little frustrating because you know being soaking wet, you want to a get warm and b you know dry out. So that was that was pretty frustrating. So um, you have any tips or, or suggestions for fire starters or uh, ways to kind of combat that damp. i think i mean i think i've tried all the fire starters i've tried the uh the flint and steel variety and i've had at least three different ones um one of them was really nice you know it had like a nice wood handle i want to say it was called fire fast has like a little section of a hacksaw blade that you can scrape the magnesium with um, you can get a really good sized pile of magnesium which burns super hot but then kind of doesn't last a real long time but that can be really helpful Stuff that I'm sure, you know, you've heard about before, um, you know, bringing like sock lint or emptying out the dryer lint mm-hmm. yes. and trap and bringing your own little like kindling kit. Um, I've tried, uh, I've tried like different flint and steels and there are some that are definitely not worth it. Like at discount hardware stores, they sell um, like a knockoff version of just like the magnesium block with the ferrocium strip on it. Mm-hmm. And those have some kind of like gummy, gluey kind of stuff in them. Um, and there's even like YouTube videos where they demonstrate how there is just like nothing flammable in there yeah. compared to like a real one. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first started out, you know, I just had like a little miniature Bic lighter and then my backup plan was waterproof matches, mm-hmm. which I didn't have to go to very often. I always had trouble, um, lighting the ones that I had, the yeah. little strike strip just didn't seem like it was worth anything. But, um, I think like, honestly, they all will start a fire, um, and nothing beats just being able to like locate some semi-dry wood yeah you know or i mean sometimes you can't but there's like wood that's just soaked and will never never burn Mm -hmm. and then there's there's wood that's wet but if you can get a little bit of fire going it'll dry out enough in the process to burn and um you know and then there's wood that's like uh ready to go it's just harder to find in the wild i guess yeah in some places yeah, I, I kind of tend to have the dryer lint in like an <clears throat> Altoid can, you know, set up with some matches. I, I used waterproof matches last time, and um, that typically works. I just, I couldn't get that going. I also tried uh, some of these little, like, they remind me of baking soda, kind of like moist and compact in these little cubes. Yeah. But they're fire starters, and they, they last for a minute or two, um, but they're... They didn't really work very well either, but I'm excited about some stuff. I, I just bought uh, the other day that should be coming in the next couple of days. I was, I was hoping it would get here before we started talking about it, but it's called a Blackbeard Firestarter, and it's like three black cords that are kind of braided. It looks like a, a pirate's beard yeah. kind of thing, and I don't know what the material is. I got to read a little bit more on it, but it's it's pretty impressive because like their demo video they see it that you like throw it in a creek bed and pull it out and cut off a little section of it and then like roll it around your hand to where it frays and it looks Mm. it looks almost like uh like rope you know it's kind of like uh roughed like that and then they just can hit it with a striker fires right up and it burns for like four or five minutes so you have plenty of time to get some wood around it kindling around it dry it out um other things that I've I've tried in the past that, you know, try to avoid just, like, soaking wet stuff, like you said, but the feathering method, you know, where you just kind of, yeah. like, take your knife and, and feather the, the sticks a little bit. Um, a lot of stuff that, like, I wasn't really in Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts much, um, but I've got a pretty good bushcrafting book that I bought on Amazon that is great for, like, you know, fire starters and shelters and all that kind yeah. of stuff. So I'm, I've been like picking and choosing. I haven't read through like page for page, but I've picked and cho- chose some different topics that I wanted to get some information on. And I learned the feathering method <clears throat> thing there. Um, so I've had some mild success with that, but just that trip, there was a no go. Like there was just yeah. too much moisture. In. And it's like a paradox sometimes because when it's really dry and you're likely to find good firewood, there's usually a fire ban because they don't want you setting the woods on fire. And then the the trips where, you know, it would be totally safe to have a fire. You can't find any dry firewood anywhere. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So that's, uh, that's always something that, you know, I would, I'm, I'm of the mindset that like when I go camping, camping equals fire, like all the time, you know, and, but that, that trip was good because it was like kind of transitioning me into a, a longer term hobby of backpacking with these certain trips I might go on where they have fire bands or they they're just not allowed to have fires in them and, and for protection states and all that so I mean 
it was it wasn't a game changer. It def- I mean, it definitely was would have added to the environment a little bit, but it didn't like yeah. kill my vibe because I couldn't have a fire. You know, it just it just would have been a little bit nicer. But. I think that that kind of like speaks to your you know your inner backpacker because <laughs> if you can go on a trip like that where you've been completely soaked and then soaked again and still want to come back and do it, you know, yeah. that's that's neat to me. You know, that says that you're you're really in it to. Yeah, to enjoy that experience, even if you if it is a little rough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, growing up, you know, just having that that desire to sleep outside and, and see all these cool places and stuff, you know, like that. It just it it speaks to those just those times just turn into memories, you know, mm-hmm. or cool stories. You know, it's not like that's going to end my hiking career. I'm sure if that was like it every single time I went, you know. Yeah, yeah. You need to you need to have a win sometimes. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I didn't mention this earlier, but like it was a total bummer when we got to Springer because it was so cloudy. That, like mm. there was no view. We got we to had the, the same problem when we were on this on the uh, Appalachian Trail in the Smokies. There were a couple of balds that you know my friend Josh in particular was really looking forward to. Yeah. We got up there, and I mean, it was just like a fog bank in all directions. Yeah. yeah. But, Which is typical in the Smokies. Yeah. That's why they're called the Smokies. But I mean, you know, if you like, if you get to do that section, like if you ever go north uh, from Fontana Dam, you're in for a real treat. Once you get, you know, once you get above um, the valley floor, it's a pretty brutal uphill battle out of Fontana Dam. Um, but once you get up there, it is like ridge walking at its finest. Yeah. I mean, there are places... You're talking about the approach to, like, um, Clingman's Dome? Yes. Okay. And even from Clingman's to the I-40 crossing, which at that point, you're you're kind of mostly descending. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, there were places I remember where we all stopped. We were in a group of five, four or five, I can't remember now. And we just stopped to kind of appreciate the fact that the trail was literally, like, the trail went through the middle of this table... And then there was like a little bit of brush and then it just fell both wow. sides. I mean, wow. no, no wider than the table. And you could stand there and just have, you know, one trekking pole in North Carolina and the other one in Tennessee. And it just, That's it just awesome. kept doing that, you know, and you're not killing yourself going up or down. It's just, you know, you're, you're walking the ridge. I had no idea that those, those types of sections were this far south. I, when I pictured, when I saw pictures and saw like, you know, uh, trail footage from those types of places i always assumed it was like way north you know yeah. but that's cool that's really motivating to to hear because like i that's what i want to experience yeah. and so yeah i'll definitely like plan a section through there because that's I, mean, I knew that the ascent was going to be tough but like originally that's what i wanted to do with john our first trip was to go through smoky mountain national park to up to clingman's dome but the park was closed because of some other stuff or mm-hmm. there was like sections of the trail that weren't really um, recommended that you hike. And then like yeah. the shelters were booked up and all that. So we ended up doing completely changing our, our route and going southbound. Um, so we started like just outside the park and then kind of went down, but yeah, that's good. Good to know. So, well, um, that pretty much covers, you know, everything that I, I had in mind to talk about today. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and uh, you know, it's crazy. I didn't realize how many people that I knew, like when I first started getting into this, you, you mentioned it to one person that you're going to do a section of AT and it's like, you find 15 people yeah. that love hiking and uh-huh. stuff. It's just, it's crazy. It's like, I don't know, those hidden, hidden hobbies that, you know, unless you're out kind of broadcasting it you don't really know how many people are into it. So it was cool. Like when your name popped up I was like, yeah, I got to get him on the show. That'd be great. I'm glad he, I'm glad John, you know, mentioned it. And you know, he's another person that I want to backpack with more and I'm glad that um, he, he did more trips after that first one, you know, cause the, the first one isn't going to be perfect. It's yeah. just not, and neither yeah. is the 10th one or the hundredth one, but yeah. that's, that's neat. And I, I definitely want to hit the trail with you sometime. Yeah, man, we got to do it. This, this is just talking about it. It's kind of what my appetite to get back out there. Yeah. Well, when the weather starts cooling off a little bit, we'll, we'll definitely plan a trip and get it going. Sounds good. So I appreciate you coming on and, uh, just real quick before we wrap up, I got to do my shameless plug to for promotions here so if you guys are listening to the podcast and uh you're not aware we've got a facebook and instagram and youtube uh pages um on social media so go by and check those out subscribe follow um be sure you subscribe to to the youtube channel we're going to be putting out some um, gear reviews and and unboxing videos here in in between the full episodes so if you're not watching uh you're going to miss that stuff so um appreciate you tuning in um 
as always, I, I'm genuinely appreciative of everybody who takes time to listen to these episodes and give me feedback and, and follow along. So I appreciate all the fans, and we're going to get back into it, get back on a regular schedule. I'm ready to, to go back to normal here. So um, thanks again for coming on, man. And, Thank uh, you. And to everybody else, let's hopefully see you out on the trail. I'm Tim Garland. This is The Trail Connection. <laughs>